This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Let's move on to the post-game chart deck. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says looking for the downloads. Patrick, perspective on market breadth. Page two, we have, as normal, a S&P 500 chart. How come it's not 500 points lower? I don't get it. Eric, the question of as to why the market's now down another 500 points, I mean, a lot of th- people, I think, are expecting this to play out the way March 2020 did, where it's just a crash and it instantly all uh, comes together in one shot. But uh, what has been uh, consistent throughout the, since the start of the year is that this has been a grind lower and it hasn't been an easy short. Every time you try to short this market, the market just uh, theta burns you and chews you up a little bit and yet still finds a way to go down and uh, just because it's not manifesting in one big volatile downwards uh, crash doesn't mean the market isn't going to work its way lower in, in a period of high inflation, high interest rates and tight monetary policy. There is uh, a prevailing downtrend that is uh, very natural in that environment and I don't see any reason why you know one would deviate from that. But with that said, when we look at the chart, the one thing that we were highlighting over the last two weeks was the fact that the market needed to clear 4,000 in order for the bulls to in any way even demonstrate that they had uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, you know buying strength to reverse the tr- uh, the prevailing trends, and what's been continuing on over and over again is failed rally, uh, failed rally, rolling over, rolling over. It's just not it, we, a catalyst for buying has not yet emerged, and uh, maybe that uh, may increase the chance that this is a little bit more sideways price action. But uh, I still think that the vulnerability down to 3,500 or 3,400 is real. Now that we're in the OPEX uh, option expiration week, which typically can uh, pin markets in these kind of conditions, uh, it'll be interesting when we start seeing those earnings coming out ne- uh, over the next couple of weeks, whether or not that becomes that catalyst for another uh, 10% downside to kind of move. But what I wanted to... Uh, really highlight here Eric, on pages three, four, and five is just uh, look at everything from sentiment to some breath indicators to really kind of gauge as to are we truly oversold enough to call this a bottom? Uh, now, when the uh, CNN uh, fear greed index, we're at about 22 uh, uh, which is their uh, extreme fear reading. But uh, when you really break it down to some of the different components, yeah, you know, things like, for instance, credit spreads in the high yield junk bond market are widening, but there's still lots of room to go on different things. VIX is not really above its 50 day moving average or the other types of things that uh, would typically be associated with a true blow off bottom. So we're not seeing, in my opinion, extreme fear the way that this reading is saying. Now, if you look even on something like uh, the New York Stock Exchange percentage of stocks above their 50-day moving averages, we're hovering around 22%. But we're far off from the lows that were established in May and June. And so while the markets are trading with a stone's throw of their uh, trading low of the year, we still are not seeing these extreme readings, which typically would be associated with a tradable market low. When we look on page five, I have the bullish percentage index on the S&P 500. And while uh, we did a few months ago experience a very sharp sell-off downwards, uh, we still, again, are not showing any extreme readings, at least not at this moment, that are are showing that capitulation. And so I, I just feel like this market 
is still vulnerable. And while, yeah, you're right, it didn't have its feet kicked out for a you know 500 point drop uh, in short order. I also don't see a reason though for it to start going up here. And uh, until some catalyst emerges that way, I think the right thing to do is respect the prevailing trends, uh, which are still very distinctly uh, uh, pointing to weaker markets. Patrick, I definitely agree that stock markets ought to be headed much lower. I, I also thought the euro was likely to uh, to trade off. And boy, let's take a look at page six. Uh, you warned us that if we saw a break below that support level that had been holding for a couple of months, you look out below. Well, guess what? We're there. We're below parity. Uh, I think I mentioned on the show a couple of weeks ago, d- despite whatever you learned about efficient markets and professionals and so forth, there's an emotional factor here. Below parity, it's the first time it's happened in 20 years. It's going to freak people out. I I predicted it might accelerate the selling from there. We'll see what happens. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there. When you go to much bigger picture charts like uh, weekly and monthly charts, there is at this point uh, uh, some different measured targets that you could take down to even ninety or ninety-five cents. But I'm not, not so certain or confident that that's a reasonable short-term target. Maybe next year or something like that. But the the key. Uh, here is is that I I think that with this kind of a pronounced downtrend in the euro and more importantly the fact that we are seeing a recession in Europe as well as all sorts of issues emerging uh, I think that uh, Europe will need uh, uh, some sort of change in their macro conditions in order for the sentiment to shift for money to flow back to Europe. And so while we're quite oversold and we could easily put together two, 300 pip reaction the other way uh, after the headline prints uh, showing all the parity uh, being hit, uh, I still think that uh, this downtrend can stay uh, in place for months to come and uh, a big tell will be how, how strong it bounces and where it goes. And that's certainly something on my mind. Patrick, before we move on, I just want to point out a possible outlier here on the euro US dollar chart, which is that a number of analysts have said if Putin were to actually cut Europe off from gas intentionally, in order to tank their economy. Germany would be the hardest hit. Uh, It would really just tank the entire European economy. They would be in really big trouble. And a lot of people think that could take the euro down to 90 cents even, uh, a full dime down from here, 10% lower from here. Now, I don't think that that's going to happen until at least October for reasons that I stated in the uh, market wrap before the feature interview. But what I do think is quite possible is the scheduled restart of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline next Friday on the 22nd of July. Let's assume that that gets delayed just for entirely legitimate logistical reasons. They've got this problem with the turbine, whatever it is. I think that a whole bunch of people are likely to panic and say, oh my gosh, the doomsday scenario that I read about on internet blogs is happening. We've been cut off from gas. Europe is about to go into the dark ages. Uh, You know, horrible. Now, I'm not saying that can't happen. I, I think it doesn't happen until October. But a bunch of people might very well freak out and think it's starting to happen. Uh, sometime around next Friday or the the following uh, few days, if it doesn't get turned on, that could result in another really big wave down in the euro. We'll see what happens. All right. Well, Eric, we got to get to that crude oil chart. I know you uh, are highlighting a lot of your views in the market wrap at the beginning. But let's just technically observe some interesting observations. The the, uh, the sell-off that we saw here that happened over the last two, three trading sessions that wiped uh, the crude oil from basically around $105 little intraday high. Uh, down to uh, to the 90 handle is now testing interestingly uh, the lows that were uh, put in during the March sell-off after uh, the uh, Ukraine uh, Russia confrontation pop that uh, saw crude oil uh, uh, move higher. So we're now uh, at the stage where uh, there we're starting to give back now about 50 percent of the entire rally we've done throughout the since the start of the year and so this is a really interesting level like i know that uh, there are some that mention that we could see even 80 dollars or lower on a short-term basis but i actually think this 90 dollar area was the area that i thought was going to actually be a very reasonable place where crude oil could put in a low but i didn't expect it to get here this quickly and i think that's what the part that makes me a little nervous about is that even though the, the price 
price level is interesting to me. The fact that it got here in just a couple of days uh, makes me ask the question as to whether or not uh, there might still just be a more liquidity-driven selling that does some sort of a little more of a washout here. Uh, what's your thinking technically on this? Well, since we're talking about technical phenomena, I want to point something out that I think is probably likely to happen next week. And it has to do with the expiration of the August contract when we have this much backwardation in the system. So right now, as I'm speaking, the August crude oil contract, that's the front month contract, is around $95.50. Well, because we have such wide time spreads, right now as I'm speaking, I'm looking at two spot 86, so almost $3 of difference between the August and September contracts. That means that the September contract is only trading at $92.50, $3 lower than August. Now, if you believe in efficient markets and supposedly everybody's a professional and knows how this stuff works, when when the front month price suddenly drops by $3 just because the August contract expires next week. So it's not that the price of the September contract went down by $3. It's just that September became the front month contract. In other words, the price hasn't changed at all. But the advertised price that you see, you know, when you get your quote is $3 lower than you remember it being yesterday. People tend to say, oh, my gosh, the price went down by three bucks. And I'm, I'm, when I say people, I mean including professional investors who are supposed to be paid to know better. Usually what happens when we get that is it's a buy the dip. They say, oh, my gosh, it dipped three dollars. Buy that dip. I want to buy it. In this environment, I think it could be perceived as, oh, my gosh, it went down another three bucks. Well, it didn't actually move at all. It's just a contract expired. It's a technicality that you're supposed to understand if this is what you do for a living. But not everybody does. It's gone down three bucks. It's no longer a, a 90 something handle. Maybe it's an 89 because, you know, it's still traded a little bit lower from where it is now. And, and all of a sudden it's an 80 something and people really start to panic. So that three dollar difference or the three dollar move lower in price that happens just as a function of the August contract expiring, I, I think could lead to some emotional reactions by traders. And beyond that, Patrick, you know, I could go on for hours on crude oil and what I think. Uh, I did talk to George Gammon quite a bit a lot of, about a lot of these issues. There's a link in the research roundup to that interview. Why don't we leave it there? Eric, let's just move on to page eight here where uh, we have silver. And I wanted to simply highlight uh, that while gold has been weakening down to its uh, support lines and where it put in 2021 lows, you know, in that 1700 level, uh, more or less, uh, we uh, see silver, on the other hand, go through quite an awful downdraft. I mean, we blew through the 2021 lows back in May, and really, uh, silver just has not looked back. I mean, we've seen some incredible selling. I know that uh, Julian was talking about uh, some levels around 19, but this selling continues to be so intense, and we're so looking like we're heading down to those uh, mid-teen levels on the downside. But uh, I'm, I'm starting to think that this is now going to be an interesting buy on dip at some point. The question really is, where is the uh, the short-term swing bottom going to emerge, and, and will it just continue to be a story of the U.S. dollar that's driving this? Well, Patrick, my hesitation there, I, I agree with everything you said in principle, but I think the silver market in particular has a lot of weekends in it. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but the, the same generation that's into crypto has been on this Wall Street silver kick. And I think that there's a lot of younger investors who thought silver could only go up. And as we're seeing this phenomenon of both gold and silver going down, uh, I think potentially just as crypto got hit harder than the stock market, which I think is probably a function of the experience level of the people who are trading it, I wouldn't be surprised if there is room for a really deep washout, let's say down to 12 bucks or so on silver. Now, if that happens, yeah, it's definitely a bargain. You, you want to buy it. Uh, it it's, it's a real buying opportunity. But I see a lot of possibilities. Silver is famously much more volatile than gold. And I think there's plenty of room for it to really dump here. But let's move on to page nine, where we see the Bloomberg Commodity Index. What do we have here? Yeah, and Eric, I just simply wanted to highlight the uh, look at it as a bigger basket of the uh, commodities. And what's interesting here is, is that the entire commodity complex was a, it had a, an extraordinarily bad uh, second quarter. And the only thing that actually kept these index higher 
was the fact that crude oil was doing so well. And it's such a huge weighting in this index. And what's, a, what's particularly noteworthy is the fact that when crude oil started to break here a month ago, it um, uh, really has now trickled in to almost any metric that you're measuring of the entire commodity story. And uh, so we're really now in a very clear correction in the entire commodity space. And I think that that's an important thing to highlight. We're, we're now at a stage where, you know, U.S. dollar up and it's like bonds, equities and commodities are all now getting hammered and it's uh it's a scenario where there's pretty much no safe havens left and uh and i think that that's uh, going to continue to play an important factor from a sentiment perspective let's move on to page 10 and the 10-year bond yield Eric, uh, one thing I wanted to just highlight, we were talking about whether or not that 10-year bond future was going to put in a bottom last week. And what I found really interesting was that uh, interest rates did not move on that CPI print, uh, at least not meaningfully. And uh, I kind of asked that question, well, you know, if uh, a rising dollar and subsequently uh, a proper uh, uh, inflation scare, the way that CPI print came in, wasn't going to cause bonds to have another nasty sell-off or yields to blow out, uh, what will? I mean, it's starting to make me think uh, whether or not the, we've seen at least some short to intermediate high in those yields. It's not that next year or something that can't go higher and if the macro conditions change, but uh, it really feels like something uh, is established establishing itself uh, as, a, as a, a topping formation here in terms of how far we go with these yields. Listeners, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading, Patrick's trading service. Information is on page 11 of the slide deck, or you can just go to bigpicturetrading.com. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.